court was still celebrating the birth of Princess Rhaenyra's child when her stepmother, Queen Alicent, also went into labour, delivering Viserys his third son, Daron, who unlike that of Jacaris, testified to his Targaryen blood. By royal command, the infant Jacaris Valarian and Daron Targaryen shared a wet nurse until weaned. It was said that the king hoped to prevent the enmity between the two boys by raising them as milk brothers. If this was Viserys' intent, it's very clear his plan did not work. A year later, in 115 AC, there came a tragic mishap of the sort that shapes the destiny of kingdoms. The Lady of Runestone, Ray Royce, fell from her horse while hawking and cracked her skull upon a stone. She lingered for nine days before finally feeling well enough to leave her bed, only to collapse and die within an hour of rising. A raven was duly sent to Storm's End and Lord Baratheon dispatched a messenger by ship to Bloodstone on the Stepstones, where Prince Daemon was still struggling to defend his meagre kingdom against the men of the Tyrarchy and their Dornish allies. Daemon flew at once to the Vale, he said, though more likely it was in the hopes of laying claim to her lands, castles and incomes. In that, Daemon failed. Runestone instead passed to Lady Ray's nephew, and when Daemon made appeal to the Eyrie, not only was his claim dismissed, but Lady Jane Arryn warned him that his presence in the Vale was unwelcome. Flying back to the Stepstones afterwards, Prince Damon landed at Driftmark to make a courtesy call upon his partner in conquest, the sea snake, Corlys Velaryon. High Tide was one of the very few places in the Seven Kingdoms where the king's brother could be confident he would not be turned away. There, his eyes fell upon Lord Corlys's daughter, Lena, a maid of 22, tall, slender, and surprisingly lovely, with a great mane of silver gold hair, ringlets that fell down past her waist. Lena Valarian had been betrothed from the age of 12 to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos, but the father had died before they could wed, and the son soon proved to be a wasteful fool, squandering his family's wealth and power before turning up on Driftmark. Lacking a graceful means to rid himself of the embarrassment, but unwilling to proceed with the marriage, Lord Corliss had repeatedly postponed the wedding. Prince Damon fell in love with Lena. Men of a more cynical bent believed the prince saw her as a way to check his own descent. Once seen as his brother's heir, he had fallen down the line of succession and neither the Greens nor the Blacks had a place for him. But House Valarian was powerful enough to defy both parties with impunity. Wary of the Stepstones, free at last of his wife, Damon Targaryen asked Lord Corlys for his daughter's hand in marriage. The exiled Bravosi betrothed remained an impediment, but not for long. Damon mocked him to his face so savagely, the boy had no chance but to call him to defend his words with steel. Armed with Dark Sister, the prince made short work of his rival and wed Lady Lena Valarian a fortnight later, abandoning his kingdom on the Stepstones. Prince Damon knew that his brother would not be pleased when he heard of his marriage. Prudently, the prince and his new bride took themselves far from Westeros soon after the wedding, crossing the narrow sea on their dragons. Some say they flew to Valyria, in defiance of the curse that hung over the smoking wasteland, to search out the secrets of the dragon lords of old. Mushroom reports this as fact in his testimony, but there is abundant evidence that the truth was far less romantic. Prince Damon and Lady Lena flew first to Pentos, where they were feasted by the city's prince. The Pentoshi feared the growing power of the Triarchy to the south, and saw Damon as a very valuable ally against the three daughters. From there, they crossed the disputed lands to Old Volantis, where they enjoyed a similar warm welcome. Then, they flew up the Rhoyne to visit Cahor and Norvos. In those cities, far removed from the woes of Westeros and the powers of the Triarchy, their welcome was far less rapturous. Everywhere they went, huge crowds turned out for a glimpse of Vagar and Caraxes. The dragon riders were once again in Pentos when Lady Lena learned she was with child. Ruling against further flight, Prince Damon and his wife settled in the manse outside the city walls as a guest of the Pentoshi Magister until such time as the baby was born. Meanwhile, back in Westeros, Princess Rhaenyra gave birth to a second son late in the year 115 AC. The child was named Lucaris, Luke for short. Septon Eustace tells us that both Solena Valarian and Sir Harwin Strong were at Rhaenyra's bedside for his birth. Like his brother Jace, Luke had brown eyes and the healthy head of brown hair, rather than the silver hair of a Targaryen. But he was a large and lusty baby, and King Viserys was delighted with him when the child was presented at court. However, these feelings were not shared by his queen. Do keep trying, Queen Alicent told Sir Lainor. Sooner or later, you may get one that looks like you. And the rivalry between the Greens and the Blacks grew deeper finally reaching the point where the Queen and the Princess could scarce suffer each other's presence. Thereafter, Queen Alicent kept to the Red Keep, 
whilst the princess spent her days on Dragonstone, attended by her ladies, Mushroom, and her champion, Sir Harwin Strong. Her husband, Sir Lainor, was said to visit frequently. In 116 AC, in the free city of Pentosh, Lady Lena gave birth to twin daughters, Prince Daemon's first true-born children. Prince Daemon named these girls Bela, after his father Balon, and Raina, after her mother. The babies were small and sickly, but both had fine features, silver white hair and purple eyes. When they were half a year old and stronger, the girls and their mother sailed to Driftmark, whilst Daemon flew ahead with both dragons. From high tide, he sent a raven to his brother in King's Landing, informing the king of the birth of his nieces, and begging leave to present the girls at court to receive his royal blessing. Though his hand and small council argued heatedly against it, Viserys consented, for the king still loved the brother who had been the companion of his youth. Damon is a father now, he told Grand Maester Melos. He will have changed. Thus were the sons of Balon Targaryen reconciled for the second time. In 117 AC on Dragonstone, Princess Rhaenyra bore yet another son. Sir Lena was at last permitted to name the child after his fallen friend, Sir Joffrey Lonmouth. Joffrey Valarian was as big and red-faced and healthy as his brothers, but also like them, had brown eyes, brown hair, and features that some at court called common. The whisperings and rumours began once again. Amongst the Greens, it was an article of faith, seen as a fact that the father of Rhaenyra's sons was not her husband, Sir Lainor, but her champion, Harwin Strong. Mushroom says as much in his testimony, and Grand Maester Melos hints at this, while Septon Eustace raises the rumour only to dismiss them, but for many, the evidence spoke volumes that Rhaenyra Targaryen's children were in fact fathered by Harwin Strong. Whatever the truth of these allegations is, there was never any doubt that King Viserys still meant for his daughter to follow him upon the Iron Throne, and her sons to follow her in turn. By a royal decree, each of the Valarian boys were presented with a dragon's egg in the cradle. Those who doubted the paternity of Rhaenyra's sons whispered the eggs would never hatch, but the birth in turn of three young dragons gave lie to their words. Something that should be remembered is that whether the boy's father was Harwin Strong or Lena Valarian, their mother was still a Targaryen, and they still possessed the blood of old Valyria. The hatchlings were named Vermax, Arax, and Tyrax, and Septon Eustace tells us that Viserys sat Jace upon his knee atop the Iron Throne and was heard to say, one day this will be your seat, lad. Childbirth exacted a toll on the princess. The weight that Rhaenyra gained during her pregnancies never wholly left her, and by the time her younger son was born, she had grown stout and thick of waist, the beauty of her girlhood a fading memory, though she was but 20 years of age. According to Mushroom, this only served to deepen her resentment of her stepmother, Queen Alicent, who remained slender and graceful, 